Chapter 1 of our AIS textbook focuses on the overarching idea behind the class. How do we use computer systems to support business, particularly in the accounting area? And so this is sort of a modification of a traditional information systems class in that we're a little bit more focused on the accounting discipline itself. So this chapter is going to talk about a lot of big concepts that we're going to kind of flesh out throughout the course. When we look at the major learning outcomes for the chapter, we see we can kind of separate it into these two different pieces. We're going to talk a lot about these value chains or accounting cycles idea. And this is just sort of like a mental model for how to go into a company and make sense of the thousand and one things that are going on inside of it. And we look at an AIS, Accounting Information System, we're going to talk about how the AIS supports those value chain activities. If you've ever taken a general kind of management class, you probably run into this value chain idea before, but we're going to kind of flesh it out a bit as we look at the accounting specific elements. First thing you should be thinking about is why do you care? Right? So a lot of you are accounting students, and so AIS is going to be part of your job, whether you like it or not. Some of you are also MIS students. So for the MIS students, you might think, oh, why should I care about this? Or maybe you're taking the class for a totally different reason, your marketing or management. So why should you care about IT? Uh, one of the first things you do is look at just the context here. A lot of money gets spent on technology. So if you look at the chart on the upper left-hand corner here, you can see our IT spend by industry. And we can see this, like, it's a lot of money being spent. So if you're in the software industry, obviously it's a lot. Right? You're looking at like a quarter of your revenue being spent on IT. But even looking at the averages, right? 8% of revenue being spent on IT is a huge expense for a company. And making sure that 8% pays off is pretty important. We also look at technology initiatives. So think about being you know, a manager in an accounting department for a small firm. You're very likely to be asked to be part of some kind of digital transformation project or cybersecurity project or cloud migration because they have to make sure that the IT systems are working properly. And most IT people don't really know a lot about the accounting side, and so they're going to rely upon you to be able to do this right. And when it's your system that they're managing, you have to make sure you really understand what's going on because ultimately, you're the one that's on the line. Another reason why you should care is because a lot of IT spend is actually controlled by business units. So you know, think about IT, they're going to be given money to go buy databases and servers and upgrade people to new versions of Windows. But a lot of it actually ends up being controlled by you, the business unit. And so you think about all the different areas, kind of looking at the averages here, a significant portion of your IT spend is controlled by non-IT people. And so if you're someone who's an accountant looking at being a manager, CFO, something like that, you're looking at a pretty non-trivial amount of dollars that you're responsible for spending well on a technology. So what is an AIS? What are the major things that we do with it? We can kind of break it down to a couple of different pieces here. So let's first talk about the actions. What are the things that it does? Well, first off, it collects the data. So this is something like you might see at a grocery store. You walk over to a grocery store, and someone's going to scan your items to record the sale. All right, so that point of sale system is part of your AIS because it's collecting information for you. After you collect it, you need to store it securely and make sure that it's going to be backed up, make sure it's going to be safe. All right, now you think this kind of goes without saying, but it's surprisingly difficult to make sure that all of this works properly. And so making sure the data is stored in the right format the right amount of granularity or amount of detail is actually pretty critical as well. And then we have to do something with the data to turn it into valuable information. So think about that point of sale system again. As you run through all these different, different sales for the day, your, AI, your accounting person doesn't really care about individual sales. They're looking at the bigger picture here. How many items do I have in my warehouse? What do I need to reorder? What's the, the most profitable product that I'm selling? And so being able to look at the AIS and pull out that kind of information that can lead to better decision making is pretty important. It's also not just the technology. So one of the most important parts of an AIS is actually the people. All right? And this is something that we usually overlook when we talk about you know, AIS systems. Because you think, oh, it's a database, it's a new system. But getting people OK with the system, getting them trained, making sure everyone's got the right roles is a fair, difficult, fairly difficult process. If you've ever been involved in new system implementation, you'll know this firsthand that training and getting everybody in line um, is very challenging. Related to that is the idea of processes. 
what are the, th the things that have to happen in order for the system to work properly? So we go back to our same example from the supermarket, right? We might have a process where someone comes in at the end of each day and runs a report to find out if there's anything that needs to be reordered. And they find out, okay, we're low on eggs, we're low on milk, so I go to this person and let them know, hey, we need to reorder these items that are here. And so how those processes work are, again, a fairly complex thing that you're going to have to look at. Then we have the actual technology. So these are things like the databases, point of sale systems, the, the tech stuff. So if you're an accountant, you're probably not going to be doing a ton with this specific portion. You're going to be more involved in the people, the processes, and then lastly, the controls. So what are the controls? Controls are basically how we make sure stuff actually happens. And this deals with the problem of span of control. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, you start a new business. Say you're doing a coffee cart. It's your business, you care about it. So you're gonna be pretty careful to not waste money, to record the right information, to not make any mistakes. But then you start hiring out and delegating tasks. And at a certain point, you have to just trust people are actually doing the job that you're paying them to do. Well, what happens when that doesn't happen, right? What happens when someone starts messing around, you make a new hire that's not a great hire? How will you know that that clerk is doing their job? So think about the grocery store. You know, what stops a clerk at a grocery score store from double scanning things or not scanning things? Maybe they've got a friend come in and they don't scan that expensive steak. They don't scan the, the cans. And so that person gets a whole bunch of free food. How do you detect that and how do you deal with that? That's all about controls. How do we make sure things are actually working the way they're supposed to? When we get into AIS, you'll find it's actually a really great way of getting visibility inside of an organization. And what I mean by that is think about CEO's perspective, right? CEOs come in, they see technology, they know it's important, they're spending a ton of money on it, they want to make sure it's working right. So if you in your career, if you become the kind of person who is knowledgeable about technology, knows what it can do, knows what it can't do, it actually gives you that really important visibility in an organization that results in promotions if you do your job well. And that's because technology really both limits and gives us opportunities. If a system can't support an activity, business can't do it. We also support goals by providing data and monitoring. Basically, we've got to tell the CEO, like, is this working or not? You can see some great examples of this out in the real world here. One of the examples we can see recently in the news in 2022 is from Southwest Airlines. They had a terrible, terrible holiday season. And basically what happened is their, their IT system was overstretched, it was under-maintained, and it crashed during the holiday season. And because of Southwest, the way they operated, it basically tanked their, their holiday sales. And this is kind of a classic problem for every organization. Every organization has what's called legacy code or legacy systems. These are systems that are not up to date, they're older, they might have been in place for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And they're working okay, but they also tend to be somewhat fragile. Things go wrong. And if you don't spend money maintaining and keeping this stuff up to date, when they break, it's pretty catastrophic. Imagine just like a car, right? How long has it been since you put new brake pads on? What happens if the person who knew how to install the brake pads leaves or retires, a new guy comes in, do they know that they need to do that maintenance? Maybe, maybe not. And so that's part of the problem we have with IT is that a lot of this stuff is hard to see. It's kind of invisible. And so if you don't know what's going on in an organization, it's really hard to control it and make sure it's working properly. So one of the tools that we'll think about as we analyze AIS systems is what's called the value chain. The value chain is sort of a model, a theoretical framework for analyzing activities inside of a firm. You can kind of break it down into primary and secondary activities here. So our primary activities are on the left. And what we do is we have to get stuff, we do things with the stuff, we get it to our customers, we have to get marketing and sales to get to make demand, and then we have to service things at the end. Now, I actually personally think marketing and sales belongs on the top of the primary activities. I think it makes a lot more sense to me to kind of put it first, but this is how they do it, so we kind of keep it this way. But either way is fine in, in this particular class. But basically, we drive demand, we get stuff, we do things, we get it to the customer, and then we deal with any issues that are post. So if you want to look at some examples of this, uh, let's, let's think about a uh, coffee shop again. 
Starbucks wants to get people to come into their stores, so they're going to go ahead and put out a flyer. They're going to put out social media posts. They're going to go and put a billboard saying, hey, we have a new kind of coffee. The inbound logistics then says, how do I get those beans to the store to make the actual activity happen? So we have to talk to suppliers, we have to roast things, we have to ship them, all that kind of thing. Operations, you actually turn those coffee components, those beans, into a cup of coffee that you can hand to a customer. Outbound logistics are pretty simple for Starbucks because people are literally standing there, you just hand it to them. But you can think of it as maybe you're doing delivery, right? You have an office party, you want to have a bunch of Starbucks, and so there's a delivery option there. So you got to pay people to take those coffee and deliver them to a company or business. And then for service, we say, okay, well, what goes wrong? Um, how do I make sure I get paid for it? All that kind of stuff. Now, the important idea here is we're, we've left a lot of things out of this because we kind of bucket the sort of essential but not value chain primary activities off on the side here. This is things like infrastructure, HR, technology, purchasing. We get out accounting on here. But the basic idea is that all of this stuff over here supports the value chain. Like it's necessary, but being a world leader in HR is not necessarily going to make Starbucks give someone a better cup of coffee and IT similarly. So it is a kind of a tricky idea, to like is this a primary activity or is it a secondary activity? But it's also kind of useful to think of as a business perspective. So imagine Google. You go work and you have an option to work for Google or you have an option to work for a mid-level accounting firm doing payroll. And you're thinking, okay, what's the best thing for my career? Well, at Google, it's a great company. Obviously, people are lucky to work there but you're not part of the thing that makes Google money. Google makes money off of selling ads. So when you go and work for them, you are important, you're necessary, but it's also your cost center, meaning that you're primarily going to be judged on how cheaply can you do your job. Now think of instead working for a payroll company. So maybe you offer payroll services to some small employees or small companies in the area. Well, now, because you're doing the thing that makes the company money, the better that you get, the more revenue you're going to bring in. So not only are you concerned with cost, but you're also concerned with revenue. And so as a career perspective, it's good to kind of think about what you would like more. Would you rather be in a place where you're sort of a cost center, you know, it's not super high pressure, you just kind of get the job done, or do you want to work for a place where they're selling your services and the better that you get makes the company more money? The latter generally are higher paying. So if you want to have a high paying job, you might think about ways to work for companies where you are the product being sold as opposed to a cost center. So let's talk about AIS now in the value chain. So with the value chain, we have all these different activities that we have to do. The primary activities that give value to the customer, and support activities that enable those. The AIS system acts as links between these different elements. And one thing that people often don't realize is that most modern businesses don't just have one system. They'll have tons of different systems that all kind of have to tie together for this stuff to work properly. So going back to our Starbucks example, we probably have some warehouse inventory system. You know, what do we have? What bay it is, is it? Uh, what's the status of it? We probably have got software that's mapping demand and sales. We probably have software tracking where our trucks are, are coming in and going out. We probably have software that tracks time card information. All of these things have to kind of tie together to make a unified picture of our enterprise and our operations. And so one thing we can talk about a lot is supply chain management. So supply chain is sort of this extended system that includes all of the value chain, and it'll often go into your suppliers, distributors, and customer side too. So if you're Boeing, for example, or Ford, or any of these manufacturing companies, what you'll find is that they subcontract a lot of the different parts of their business to other firms. So if you're Ford, you're not going to make tires. Well, if you have an assembly line, you need tires. So what they'll do is they will tie their systems together. So they'll say, all right, whenever we get an order, it's going to update our inventory to say that this inventory is assigned. And it's going to tell our supplier, hey, we just used four tires, reorder and give us four more. 
You can even go to customers. So you say, all right, the next one in the queue for getting in the vehicle is uh, in the West Virginia dealership in Charleston. We're going to shoot them an email and say, hey, we just started to work on the car for you. Uh, expect it in roughly seven days or whatever the delivery period is. And so that's the, all that stuff gets automated because it makes us faster and more efficient. We can kind of think of these as well in terms of cycles. You'll hit this more in the auditing class that talks about how to make sure these sort of cycles are working properly. But you can think of each of these kind of like a circle. We look at revenue, right? Revenue cycle, we're going to give goods to our customers or give services to customers, and in return, we get paid. So this is sort of what we give up. We give up the goods, we give up the services, and we get cash back as a, res as a result. And we're going to hit this as one of the first cycles we really dig into in detail in the class as we talk about how to automate and support this. Expenditure is sort of the opposite side. Instead of giving goods and services, we're going to get goods and services, and now we give cash instead of getting cash. It's sort of like the opposite. We look at production. How do we decide what to make, how much? Payroll, how do we give people their labor or financing? How do we get cash? So these are also important sort of cycles, but we don't hit them as hard in this class. We're going to more focus on the revenue and expenditure side because those are typically the ones that you uh, have the most fun kind of working with. We can kind of look at these in a little more detail about how the AIS system connects with these different organizations. So our AIS system is at the middle right over here. And we think, how does this interact with everyone around us? So for vendors, right? If we buy something from a vendor, what goes back and forth? So the first thing that happens is we send the vendor a purchase order, right? We want to get something. They give us the goods and services. After we get them, then they send us an invoice, and then we pay them. And this is actually a little more complicated, but it gives you a nice high level of what comes back and forth. And then each of these things coming back and forth between us and the information system and our vendor, we have to figure out a way to deal with in a process. So what does it look like? Is it paper? Is it a digital update to a database? Is there a website I go to? Um, and then who does it? And then how do I make sure it's actually happening? All, right, all those things we're going to have to think it through to get this entire process working correctly. And we think, all right, well, how does AIS tie in with all this stuff, right? So AIS is obviously necessary, but we can do a lot of good things for an organization with a really good AIS system. We can improve quality. So think about, again, we go back to Starbucks, right? Um, having Starbucks track how long beans have sit in, sat in a warehouse will help us manage that process better and improve the quality of our cup of coffee. Automation by automating certain redundant tasks like key and information, that's going to reduce cost, it lets us offer a better product at lower price. We can see things like be, becoming more efficient. Um, some AI systems are going to focus on sharing knowledge. So this might be a knowledge base where people type in information so other people can figure out information about it. A lot of it also comes down to decision making. How do we make sure that a CEO knows enough about an organization to make good decisions? Keeping the executive staff updated is really critical. So asking questions like, what's our turnaround time for beans? How long do they sit before we use them? Are we overbuying? Are we underbuying? Do we need to make sure we have more strategic reserve? You know, all those kind of high-level questions are really improved by having really good, rigorous, solid data. Now, we're hearing a lot about AI and particularly like large language models like ChatGPT. But this is just sort of a, like a layer you can think of that goes on top of these computer systems. What we find in the real world is that AI is not going to replace people. What it does do, though, is it should make you more efficient. And we think about all this hard work in working with this kind of stuff. Getting all of these things right are kind of a precondition to be able to use AI until I have all the stuff documented and the proper control so I've got good quality data and the right people are in charge of it, if I don't have good data, I can't train an AI model on any of this stuff. Once I do have it trained, though, then I can deploy AI and try to make that process better. So we think about vendors, for example. Um, there's, there's ways you can kind of calculate how much to buy and when, but we can also train a system to do those kind of calculations for us. So I can train my AI to say, hey, whenever I've got inventory below a certain level, buy something. But also, if the weather's bad, maybe I need to increase that lead time a bit because it'll take longer to be delivered. 
Or if someone consistently delivers things late, maybe it'll automatically add a couple of days of padding so that we get everything on time. So there's a lot of ways we can kind of work with this data and make better decisions with it. But we have to have the core AIS system put together first, because the AI can't do anything without good data. A lot of what this class looks like as well is data analytics. Data analytics is sort of the layer on top of this stuff that we do. But it's saying that, hey, we have these databases with tons of data. How do we get that data out? All right, so that's why we say analytics here. Analytics are basically going to go on top of the data and try to figure out how do we answer questions with that data that's available. And that means you have to understand what exactly does that data look like, what are the limitations of it. It involves software skills, or how do you get data into the right format. It involves social skills, how do you make sure that people are giving you the right data and that it's not incorrect. It involves business skills, how do I make sure that I'm calculating things correctly according to GAP. But what we're going to do in this class a lot of times, I'm going to give you these problems, and you're going to use analytics to try and answer those questions. So you might say, um, I have a problem in inventory. All right, so you have to go in there and figure out kind of what's the pr exact problem. You've got to figure out how to get the right data. You use that to make recommendations and then some kind of actionable insight. And so this is part of how we make the class kind of applied is we'll be problem focused as much as possible to try and give you some real world-esque style problems that you can use these analytics to sort of deal with. You probably also heard the term cloud computing. Cloud computing is the idea that instead of having computers in my office, instead I'm going to put them on someone else's physical site. And the idea is that we want to focus on our special sauce. I don't want to have to hire electricians for my coffee business, right? I'm going to outsource that to another firm and they can worry about electricians. So really, I don't really want to handle payroll. If I can outsource payroll, great, it's one less thing I've got to deal with. And so with computing, we're going to outsource a lot of this stuff in the future so that we have to do less of it ourselves. So that's a summary of our chapter one AIS textbook. Hopefully it gives you some ideas on a big picture of things that we're going to work with in the class here. The major thing you should be taking away from this are back to the learning objectives. What's the value chain and what are the cycles? And then what is an AIS and how does it kind of fit into these elements here? As you work through class, you'll see that we will sort of work through a lot of these accounting cycles as you learn specific concepts and principles from our textbook. So when we get into this, the section on databases, we'll see how databases work in revenue. And when we get into the section about data visualization, we're going to visualize how to figure out how much money is coming in versus how much money is going out. Um, but you'll see that it all kind of ties together as we kind of move further throughout the course. I think it's a great topic. I think this is a really interesting area because it's super practical in businesses. If you're sharp and you work hard, it can be, make you very, very successful.